the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 652 for Sunday, April 9th, 2017. Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your questions, tips, and cool stuff found. We share it all, and the goal is for each and every one of us, me included, to learn at least four new things every single time we get together. Today will be no exception. I am certain we have three sponsors for you today, and all three of them are new. We have Away Luggage at away.com slash MGG, where coupon code MGG saves you 20 bucks off of the coolest suitcase I've ever used. So we'll talk more about that later. Bitbucket.org slash for the code is where you go to sign up for your free Bitbucket account. An awesome uh, Git repository tool. So we'll talk about that in a moment for you coders out there. And Jamf now at Jamf.com, J-A-M-F.com slash M-G-G. We can go and get uh, your first three devices signed in for free forever. Jamf lets you manage, uh, remotely manage all of your Mac and iOS devices. It's actually pretty cool. So we'll talk about that later too. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun. And, and those, that's right. And uh, and and we have a very special guest today uh, from both the Mac Observer and from App Advice. Uh, we have Jeff Butts, a.k.a. Jeff Burns, joining us today. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's awesome to have you, man. Thanks for having me. It's yep. fun. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Jeff's been doing a bang-up job. For those of you that haven't noticed, and you probably have, uh, Jeff's been doing a bang-up job for us here at TMO with, with some great tips, in addition to all the great stuff he does over at App Advice, too. So, uh, so it's a pleasure to have you here. We're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, Email encryption with you, Jeff, because because uh, you have cracked a bit of the code that's plagued us all for years. But uh, but we'll have you here for the whole show, and and uh, I'm sure you'll be chiming in on other stuff too. Fun stuff. Anything you want to say, Jeff, before we get rolling? Uh, no, just glad to be here. Okay, <laughs> awesome, John. You want to take? We had uh, a couple of follow ups and a and a quick tip. You want to take us into uh, into that to get us rolling today? I will because we got a uh, we got a good follow up here. So uh, Tim writes, "Hi Dave and John and Jeff. <laughs> I have a comment regarding the discussion of Stephen's question about changing an Apple ID email address. John referenced the great Apple Help article detailing the steps. I just wanted to highlight something in the article that I don't think was mentioned on the show. No, it was not. Um, Apple advises that you." Quote, sign out of every Apple service and device that uses your Apple ID before changing the email address at appleid.apple.com. Failure to take this step could result in unexpected problems. For instance, I have seen a case where a user was unable to authenticate with iCloud on iOS after changing their Apple ID email. The issue was that the old Apple ID email address is still displayed in the iCloud settings. The known good password was rejected because of the email address mismatch. This even prevented the user from signing out of iCloud on the device. The solution in this case was to change the Apple ID email back to the old address, sign out of iCloud on the affected device, change the Apple ID to the new address, and sign back in. I hope this is helpful. And yes, it is. Huh. That makes sense. I, I mean, it, it, it. they should have coded around this, but I get why this would happen. Yeah. Now that begs I, the question, Dave. And I don't know. The, the thing is, Apple doesn't really give you very good guidance on how to accomplish this. Um, signing out of everything, you mean? Right. There is a way, either uh, on your computer or on the web. So if you log into your iCloud account and you uh, click, I believe, on settings, you will then see a list. And I see right now my devices. Oh, okay. It shows my Apple I, Apple TV, my iPhone, my MacBook Pro, and my Mac Mini. Um, I recently removed my iPad because it's dead. So those are the four devices that I have signed in. Um, but as far as I, but I don't see anything saying, 
hey, kick all these guys off. I do see on the bottom of the screen a thing that says sign out of all browsers, which... Uh, yeah, that's, that's not quite not the same. Bit. Yeah, right. Yeah, so... And I think you had actually suggested, Dave, a, a sneaky way of... And I think I've seen this, but but I think there is a way to accomplish kicking all your devices um, off. Well, yeah, if you change your password, it will it will knock all of your devices off. I don't know if it would solve it for this problem, but but it certainly would be if you don't want to bother signing all your devices out. This would be one way to do it is change your password first, then change your uh, iCloud email address, you're going to have to log re-log into all your devices at that point anyway. And that, that might do it. I haven't tested that though. Jeff, you know anything about this? Well, it's, it seems to me that it, it must be an intermittent thing because I recently went through the process of changing my, my email address with my Apple ID and it logged everything out but I didn't have any problems logging back in. I uh-huh. did have to redo all of my, um, oh, what are they called? The the unique app-specific passwords. I had to redo all of those. Okay. But um, I could still log in just fine on my iPhone 5, my iPhone 7 Plus. Huh. Mac. All right. That makes sense. Yeah, okay. Huh. Well... Uh, it, you know, it's a good uh, it's a good heads up to uh, to ward off issues like that. So, yeah, it's something to be careful of. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. Thanks, Tim. All right, Mr. Braun. You ready? All right. Okay. Next, we have um, Dave versus Dave here. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> what happened here? So Dave writes in and address this to the other Dave. And he says, I thought your recommendation to stop using LastPass and switch to some other password manager was too strong and it was premature. Anyone who followed that advice would have gone through a lot of effort. Let, let me let me let me give you let me give you some context for those of you that haven't heard last week's episode. We talked about how there was this vulnerability in the browser extension of LastPass. And uh, and my advice, as, as you now understand, was if they don't fix this uh, within, you know, 30 days to change to something else because the the exploit was going to be made public uh, about 45 days later. So I wanted to give people time to, uh, to change to something if this exploit was not, uh, was not uh, uh, fixed. So that was my, that was my advice. And, and uh, so now continue, go ahead. Okay. Um, the problem was identified on March 27th and resolved by March 31st. The details of the exploit were not made public until after the fixed extension had been published. Here is the postmortem published by LastPass. Uh, and we also actually had um, uh, someone on Twitter let us know about this as well. And I did tweet it out on our uh, Matt Geekab Twitter account to uh, let people know. And we're telling you again. So uh, it is fixed. So LastPass for now is safe as far as we all know. Yeah. Um, and it was only an issue with the browser extension, right? Is that right? With the issue correct. With LastPass? Okay. Correct. And actually when that happened, um, so another part of the discussion, what you probably want to do, so yeah, this is the extension um, in Safari. One thing you may want to do is if you do go to Safari, preferences, you're going to see a list of extensions. And you're going to see on the bottom of the screen, a little checkbox. And it says automatically update extensions from the Safari extension gallery. <sighs> a lot of times, Dave, I'll actually, I actually prefer for something to ask permission before I update it. But in this case, I think I would endorse checking that box. And actually, when I looked, it says, oh, yeah, you got LastPass 4.1.44, which is the patched version. So it just magically happened in the background. Um. So just let people know how to make that happen and make sure that your last pass or any of your browser extensions. I, I, I actually guess I, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't want to automatically update it, except if you're a control freak, which is kind of why I <laughs> do that sort of thing. Right. So yeah, it's true. Have, so, we've never heard of an ex- exploited uh, extension making it all the way into the, the Safari gallery. Have we? I don't think so. Jeff, have you heard of one? No, no. Okay. I haven't. 
I mean, last pass, last pass has had a share of problems though. Yeah. Um, you know, um, two years ago there, they had some information stolen. Right. They said, they said that none that the encrypted user vault data wasn't taken, but they were able to get email addresses, password reminders, and encrypted passwords of master vaults. Yes. So, um, on the other hand, they're, you know, they provided, you know, from what I recall, full disclosure and they let people know that this was a problem. Um, yep, they and they did. fixed it. Um, but yeah, shame on them for that it happened to them. I think most of the password manager vendors at some point have had something terrible happen. And uh, when it yeah, does, they. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unavoidable. People are going to hack. That's just the world we live in. Right. It, it is the world we live in. Right. I mean, you, you have to assume um, if you're certainly if you're a service provider, the more popular you get, the more popular a target you become. And uh, and and then that's true for those of us as customers of of, you know, popular services like this, where some especially one that has passwords in it. <laughs> it's it's a you know, it, it's a magnet for this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's going to happen. Um, yeah. 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 So. All right, good All stuff. Right. And then, uh, John, you have a quick tip for us? I think we do. It's, it's getting pretty hairy, though, man. This is a hairy tip. All right. Uh, hello, fellas. Just thought I'd drop you an email to advise you of a problem that was driving me mad for a while today and its eventual solution. I would hate for anyone else to have been pulling their hair out as I was, especially as it turned out this was indirectly a factor in the problem. I was using my Magic Trap Cat on my new 15-inch MacBook Pro, and my mouse was behaving rather erratically. It would appear to work okay for a while, only then to become really sluggish or jump about in fits and starts. I did all the usual things, switched off, then on, unpaired, repaired. Thinking it could be an in interference, I switched off other Bluetooth devices, but nothing, still the same problem. Determined not to be stumped, I started looking at other things that might be causing a problem. Cordless phones, etc., but still nothing. As a final desperate measure before throwing in the towel for a breather, I checked my trackpad again to make sure nothing was lying on it, causing it to act funny. It was then that I had an epiphany and looked much, much closer. I had had a haircut earlier in the day, and on very close inspection, extremely fine, almost invisible hairs from the aftermath of my haircut had fallen on the trackpad. They were the blighters that was the cause of so much havoc, and appropriately enough, head scratching. <laughs> A quick blow, and the problem was solved. Next time I'm going to rock it 80s style and get a blow dry just to make sure I don't get caught. <laughs> Isn't now, that see, interesting? This this is why I always take a shower right after a haircut. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. I, I, I've I never had that problem. Um, I guess it makes sense, though. I mean, you've got this huge surface the, the entirety of which is is capacitive right touch sensitive so right yeah. it's capacitive that's how those are done right i'm not getting that yeah, wrong. Right. right yeah sure, you're right. i know um i had something similar happen with mine and it was due to something different so i just thought i'd share it since we're talking about things that make your trackpad apt up sure i use some cleaner on my computer um on my MacBook Pro at some point. And I think what I had done is I had, I had uh, used the cloth, I'd cleaned out the trackpad, and then I, I had left the cloth there, and that's what I should not have done. And I actually put the machine to sleep because I was going out, and typically I, I put my machine to sleep when I go out. And then when I got back home, I'm like, oh, man, you know, I left that cloth there. I probably should. Or, or I just took it off, and I'm like, all right. And then I started to use the machine, Oh, the trackpad was not happy. It was, uh -huh. yeah, same symptoms. Here's what had happened. Apparently, some of the liquid had seeped into the trackpad. The little seam. And as you point out, Dave, it's a capacitive device. Well, liquids can affect the performance of capacitive devices. So I think uh, the solution was, I think I got a blow dryer to try to help some of that liquid go away and then put it on its side and had a fan blow on it for a while. And eventually it came back. But um, be very careful with liquids. Right? And I don't know if it's a specific, it, it may be just specific to this model here and that there, there's a, a small seam in there that will allow liquid to get in there. Uh, maybe the design of future machines beyond my 2012 don't have that problem. 
but uh, you'll see a problem with liquids as well. Like also with touch ID. Um, I think we, we've all seen it sometimes if, if you're sweaty or your hands are wet or you just wash your hands, it won't work. It'd be like, it's, that's not you because your fingerprint appears differently. Huh? Yeah. Did I don't run into that. Well, I think you had a, didn't you have an issue once Dave with your, uh, I, I think due to your, um, uh, um, banging on the drums there, I guess, uh, uh, if your skin gets callous, that could also affect the, uh, right. Well, we, yeah, we'd touch ID for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And sweat and all that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, one thing that I've done in the past, um, I've done this with my keyboard. I've never done it with the trackpad or mouse, but um, I had a spill on a keyboard and I put it in the dishwasher just on the dry cycle. And it cured it right up. Really? Yeah. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Just on the dry cycle, folks. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I, yeah. Don't <laughs> don't put it through a whole cycle. Just turn the dial to dry. Yeah, yeah. Anything else counterindicated? Huh? Oh, so that just applied. Um, so that turns on a heating element, I guess, right? So, so yeah, it, it turns it turns on a heating element, and I uh, I don't know what else it does, but. Um, in a matter of 10 minutes, the keyboard was functional again. I believe it. Uh, I guess, I mean, you could also do the same thing with the oven, just be it, with any, anything where you're <laughs> applying. Well, no, I mean, it, you, you just need to apply heat low enough not to melt, um, any of the components, especially those of which that are plastic in, uh, in the device, because you know, mm -hmm. that's just how that goes. So yeah. If you want to flat, if you want to flash dry it. Um, I think maybe the, the, like the video that I shared in one of my posts this week, um, 25 pounds of black powder. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. That might be a little different though, Jeff, uh, onto something productive and, and, uh, and certainly the, the, the catalyst for why we have you here, Jeff, we've talked a lot on this show about email encryption and, uh, we've talked about it on the Mac. And we've lamented about it on iOS. In fact, very recently, we just said how you can set up iOS fairly consistently to decrypt emails that were sent with SMIME, which is the encryption that's built into OS X uh, right. or, and, and Mac OS or and iOS, sorry, and, and Mac OS, actually, all three. <laughs> um, but encrypting email on iOS has frankly been something that has eluded John and I here on Mac Geek Gab for a long time up until recently. And so will you walk us through some of that of, uh, of what you've what you figured out and 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 in a general sense, what the what the best uh, thing is for folks to do? I, I, we will put links to your articles in the show notes so you don't have to get into the total nitty gritty. Anything that doesn't feel comfortable trying to explain to people to remember audibly, don't worry about it. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. OK, um, basically, you know, I. I have I have these issues where I don't sleep at night, so I just start playing around with things that bother me. And so I, I wiped out most of my encryption settings on iOS and decided to start fresh. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's tricky, but if you can get these certificates in and then realize that iOS doesn't automatically import the public certificate that people send you when their emails are, are digitally signed. That was that was to me the missing link is once I realized that I had to get those public certificates into my keychain manually after that encryption started working. Yeah. So this is this is interesting. And there is something else I want to go through, because even once you and I once you explain this concept to me, it, it I still had a problem. But but yeah, on on the when when someone sends you an encrypted email. So, for example, we're going to use you and me for this example. So um, I send you a signed email. Right. So that's going to have my signature in it. What it right. also has is my public key that you can then use to encrypt an email for me. You can't decrypt anything f that that is sent to me, but you can encrypt. And that's the beauty of, of what's called public key encryption is there are two pieces to the key. 
one piece is good for encrypting data and the other is the pri- that's the public key and then the private key is good for decrypting data. It's also good for signing things uh, so that you can prove that you are who you are. But in terms of the encryption, the par- the private key decrypts it. Uh, the public key yeah. encrypts it. So the yeah, nice. It, yeah. Right. It reverse for a second. Did I have you a reverse for a second? OK, I thought I might have. Yeah. So the, the, so the idea is we send out our public keys to anyone. In fact, you can even post them publicly because no one can do anything other than encrypt data for you with that key. So uh, I send you an email that I have signed. And in the process of signing this email uh, on the Mac, you it, it, it sends along my key to you. Your Mac takes that key and puts it in your keychain without you having to do anything just by the act of you receiving the email. You yeah. know, right. You now have my public key in your in your keychain. Yep. Yep. And so if you are set up to encrypt email, you now can encrypt email to me. It's just because you have my public key in your keychain. iOS does not do this. Exactly. Which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, especially with the focus on security that Apple has had, not just recently, but for years, you'd think they would have paid a little more attention to this. So, OK, so what happens? Let's say I send you this email. You see that it's signed because there's a little what is there, a checkbox on it or a, an asterisk or something? It's blue. It's a it's a, it's a check mark inside an asterisk. That's OK. That that, that and that means something. So. uh so now what do you do? How like if, if somebody gets an email like this and, and for the record, anybody that gets email from us from either our feedback at MacGeekab.com address or our premium at MacGeekab.com address, you will see more often than not that they are signed and they have this little uh, check mark and an asterisk. So th- we are sending out our, our public keys all the time in case you want to send us stuff encrypted. So on iOS, how does someone take that key and add it to their iOS device so that they could then send out encrypted email. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to actually tap on the sender's name and um, that will take you to the information about that sender and it will indicate that there's a certificate there. And then you just have to install the certificate from there. And I go through all of that in the article showing with, with nice little uh, screenshots, exactly what you need to do. Cool. Yeah, it's it's like a three step process, which which feels a little cumbers- cumbersome. You tap on it, you hit view certificate, and then you say install, um, which is it, which which seems it's, weird because you're it's not. Very, it's very cumbersome, and I think it's one of the biggest reasons why um, third party encrypted email apps are able to make so much business. Uh yeah. <laughs> Fair point. Yeah. Um, so so while we're on this subject, so th- this is what's known as S-MIME encryption, and it is the only type of email encryption that's natively supported, uh, as, I, as we said, on both the Mac and the iPhone. And when you do install your own certificates, you now can, without even having to do anything, Encrypted email that is sent to you is just simply viewable like like anything else. Uh, it just it, it auto decrypts when you try to read the message and, and it's great. Right. Uh, or it's very convenient. I, I don't want to say it's great. I think it's great. But, you know, there is that continuum between ultimate security and ultimate convenience. And ha- by having it auto display the email, uh, you know, some people may see that as as a security risk. But uh, but that's how it works. So. There are other types of encryption. The, the most popular one is PGP or on the Mac. We use a package called Mac GPG, right? Am I getting that right, John? Is that right? Uh, Mac GPG, GPG tools GPG is the... Suite. Okay, it's, yeah, it's the GPG suite. Okay. Um, Jeff, what are your thoughts on... Uh, is, is there any security difference in your mind between... Uh, S mime and, and, and PGP slash GPG. Is there one you prefer over the other for any particular reason? I prefer S mime um, because it's centralized. Your certificate is stored on a central server and it's authenticated through this, through that server. Um, with open PGP, 
you're, you're relying on a web of trust, meaning your friends, when you get emails, when you send emails to your friends, they confirm, yes, the certificate is valid. He or she is who they say they are. You can trust this key. The problem is, is people have gotten away from actually using that feature. Right. So you might have a hard time establishing credibility for your certificate. Now, with that said, S-MIME has its problems, too. Um, certificate authorities lose credibility because of what we talked about earlier. People hack. So they get hacked. They lose their credibility because maybe they don't respond quickly enough. And this is why, you know, you see things like Symantec just had a third of its certificates um, declared no longer valid by the rest of the Internet because they didn't respond quickly enough to exploits and hacks. Right. <laughs> and, that, and that also happened with Start SSL, by the way. Start.com used to be, in fact, one of the tutorials we linked to recommended getting a certificate from Start.com. And I even used that one as an example in my first article about email encryption. And then I immediately saw that that certificate wasn't being recognized by Apple. Oh, and I looked it up, and sure enough, Google, Apple, and Mozilla had all blacklisted Start.com because they didn't respond quickly enough to problems with their security. Huh. There's a trend to this episode here, and it's how the, – the, there, there is a uh, – the, the – Rate it, or the the attention at which a company pays when they have a security risk seems almost more important than the fact that they've had one or a security exploit or a security breach. I guess is the uh, yeah. is the point because because it's going to happen uh, or it, it it is you know people are going to try to make it happen. The, the yep. question is what do you do once it does? Yeah, yeah, and just a quick tip to. Uh to the listeners, um, GPG Suite, if you're on macOS Sierra, um, they have not quite gotten it yet. They're in beta. Everything works pretty well, but there could still be some bugs in their in their software. And they let you know about that on their website. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think, right. I think they're on beta three now, which I'm on. They are. They are on beta three. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's a great set of tools. Um, and... You know, I've I've talked to the developers over there, and the problem is Apple keeps changing things. And with Mac OS Sierra, they changed so much in the APIs that it's taking the folks over at GPG Tools a while to get everything working right under Mac OS Sierra. And and most when we talk about Apple is changing things specifically, we're talking about the Apple has changed things with Mail. And, yes. and and the hooks for for baking this into mail uh, that the, I think even once Sierra came out, the prior version of GPG suite worked for doing manual uh, encryption and decryption and signing of of, you know, files or documents or whatever. It just the the mail integration was completely borked. Is that is that right? I, I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds right to me. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, very cool. Thanks, man. This is, uh, and th I mean, thank you for explaining this to us, but also thank you for figuring it out in the first place. Now, there, I said there was one other thing about mail on, uh, on iOS, and that was that even once you told me I had to manually slurp in your certificate into my iOS keychain, for lack of a better term, I mean, I, it is the iOS keychain. You can't go see it, which is sort of the frustrating part. Um, but it is there and it's akin to the, the Mac OS keychain. But uh, even once I slurped your certificate in, I couldn't uh, encrypt to you. And that was because I had previously set up encryption on uh, my encryption on iOS. I had pulled in my own certificates and then as often happens, they expire and I pulled in new ones. But for some reason, mail tends to cache things and wouldn't acknowledge that the new one was there. It kept hanging on to the old one. So the, the trick there, which you, you explain in the article is that you have to go into your certificates. Now you can, or your profiles in settings 
and I had to remove all of my personal private keys. And then I had to reboot my phone and the reboot yeah. of the phone was the key because, or the, the <laughs> no pun intended, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, because I guess some portion of mail, even if you force quit the app, some portion of mail is always running in the background on iOS and it would cache this stuff. So if I added new keys in, it wouldn't matter. It would, it would, it would, it would be as though I had done nothing. So it's crazy. I, I yeah. really hope that we have, you know, iOS 11, um, Apple re engineers this because this is important stuff. And if they could make it easy for people to do especially if Apple started their own certificate authority to really make it easy for people to do, which they kind of have already with iMessage, by the way, um, because when you're doing public key encryption with iMessage, whether you know it or not, um, that would be, that would be a nice thing. Or, or maybe they think, well, we already have it in iMessage. Why bother adding it to email? <clears throat> well, and you know, I hope that they fix it in iOS 11, but considering how long this problem has been going on, I'm, I don't have much hope for that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the uh, chat room at MacGeekUp.com slash stream, Furbies asks a very good question. Uh, doesn't adding a public key into Mac OS keychain propagate it, propagate it to iOS if you have iCloud keychain uh, sharing turned on? And, you know, it would make all the sense in the world if that were the case. Unfortunately, it's not. These are one of the few things that do not sync to iCloud. So, and they don't and sync to your other Macs either. I don't know. And, and that's what, that's what really bugs me is, you know, you turn on iCloud keychain sharing. This is the other thing that I wish was just baked into Mac OS and iOS. Give me my stupid email accounts automatically on my iPhone using iCloud keychain. Other third-party clients do it. Why can't Apple? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. All right. Well, so this Jeff, is... Go ahead, John. Yeah. Well, no, I had you. one for Jeff, but I, I think yeah. the... So there is no way, whereas on the Mac, if you go to keychain access certificates and the logging keychain, typically, I can see all of the certificates that uh, from people that have sent things to me. Right. Uh, no, um, actually, no. Oh, yeah. On the Mac OS, yes. On the Mac. Yes. Yeah, on the Mac, you can. Yes. So for people for people that want to see the the you know all of the certificates from people that have sent you uh, emails, that's where you should be able to see them. But I think you said it once before. I just want to clarify: there is there's certainly nothing in the iOS interface to let you see that. No, um, there's not that I've been able to find, and I've looked. Um, profiles doesn't show it. Um, profiles is the only place where you can see your your private right. keys. And those are my, yeah. Okay. Those so that's the only visibility you get on iOS into yep. certificates is, is your own. Um, and that, that's aggravating. I'm, you know, I'm now scratching my head, you know, is there a, a tool? Um, uh, you know, I looked at iMazing. I don't think it does it. I don't know if no. the Apple configurator, I don't think there's any tool that, that this is something that is, shouldn't be hidden, but is. Well, what, what I haven't tried yet and maybe someone else wants to, I haven't checked Cydia to see if, um, if jailbreaking see if your phone jailbreaking does it because okay. I don't I don't jailbreak my iPhone simply because I need to keep it. You know, I'll, I'll put a beta on there when there's a beta coming out that's really big. But other than that, you know, I use my iPhone so much for writing articles and, and doing how to's and screenshots that I just I can't afford to jailbreak it. Mm. So I haven't tried that. Yeah, you need it to work consistently with that of your audience. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Granted, a part of my audience is jailbreaking, but the majority are not. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's the audience you choose to to address. That's mm -hmm. right. Yep. No, it makes sense. I guess sense. the last thing that occurs to me is GPG. You mentioned Web of Trust. And I, and I think the one issue that I have with GPG, especially if you're going to get a certificate from someone else, I think believe there's the potential so if you go to a repository so i think you can also so once you generate a key pair you can upload it to some repository and then if somebody yeah. searches for it they're like oh there's john f Braun's gpg yeah it's entirely possible that someone can impersonate you and say well no i'm john f Braun. no i'm Absolutely. john f Braun." so if you're going to do the gpg thing it, it uh, i believe the the best way to get 
the certificate is directly from the individual themselves and uh, not necessarily trust a repository. Yeah. And what a lot of people have started doing is um, they won't even they'll share the the hash of their public key over another medium, like over the phone. Right. They'll just spell it out over the phone and say, this is how you decrypt my message. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> That's crazy. But but yeah. it, it is trusted um, or it, it, it adds a layer of trust. I mean, I suppose that you could be in, yeah, you know, I mean, impersonating the, someone another way. But yeah. yeah, the theory behind Web of Trust is that um, you can't fool everybody all the time, but it comes down to who has more friends. Right. Right, right, right. Interesting. All right. Um, we will uh, we will revisit this, of course. Uh, if you have any questions for us, of course, uh, I mentioned the email address once. I'll mention it again. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I think you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I did, no. unless you're a premium listener, and then it's premium at MacGeekGab.com. Uh, John, he said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. <laughs> now it's a party. That's good. <laughs> thanks, Jeff. <laughs> I've I've been wanting to do that for years. Guys. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> we are happy to have you here to do it. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so let's let's jump uh, let's jump around. Let's jump to uh, something that has nothing to do. I don't think with uh, with certificates or anything like that because it's a uh, it's a it's a heady topic and we need to relax and breathe. So uh, we will go to Chris. And Chris, uh, well, Chris has an interesting issue. He says, I've got the 2015 12-inch MacBook running 10.12.3, which I've been using. And, and actually, this might have come in. There's 10.12.4 out now, right? Yep. But, uh, and I think he had upgraded. Uh, he said, which I've been using the adapter, uh, which has USB and HDMI to connect external drives for about 18 months with no issues. Recently, I bought a 24-inch Samsung monitor, but I've been having nothing but trouble with it. At first, it would work most of the time. Sometimes the Mac acts like the monitor is connected and shows in display prefs that it detected the monitor, but the monitor won't come out of sleep mode. Sometimes unplugging the adapter and plugging it back in fixed it. Sometimes only a reboot of the Mac would. Other times it would work for a while, and then the external monitor would suddenly go to sleep, and I'd need to reboot my Mac again to fix it. Other times both the laptop and the external display would go black, and a hard boot would be required. Recently, though... I can't even get the monitor to come out of sleep mode. I've tried cycling inputs and the screen is acting like there is no input. I've got an expensive paperweight. And if I can't fix it, any ideas? So, yeah, I, I can certainly commiserate with you, Chris, but I, I might be also be able to help you. As uh, listeners might remember, I recently added a 27 uh, inch monoprice screen to my retina iMac in the office because my old Apple, my 14 year old Apple cinema display finally decided to stop working on me. Uh, and I started having almost exactly the same symptoms that Chris describes. Um, it would, I could wake my Mac from sleep. I never had trouble waking my Mac from sleep, but waking from sleep resulted in one of three conditions on the monitor. That was either it worked great. Um, it, or it would wake up, but, and, and to show and show an image, but none of my windows would be over there. If I had put windows over there, they would all have been recollected on my, uh, on my main screen or, uh, the screen would never wake up at all. It would just stay in sleep mode, even hitting the power button, nothing. Uh, I would have to power cycle the screen in order to get it to, uh, to display an image. And then of course all the windows would be recollected. So I worked with with Monoprice on this and they said, well, uh, it could be your cable. So they sent me a new cable and it seemed like that fix it for a couple of days and then it didn't. And so I started working with Monoprice again and nothing helped until Mother Nature stepped in. Now, what Mother Nature did was a week ago, Saturday Mother Nature turned off my power for about three hours uh, because there was a line down or a, uh, yeah, there was a line down in the neighborhood. We had a big, big snowstorm. Actually, we had about a foot of snow and it, it, it brought a limb down that brought a line down. Now with an iMac pulling power for 15 seconds or more 
and then reapplying power and waiting five seconds or more to turn the machine on results in an SMC reset. And that seems to have solved my problem. So the advice here is to never forget about the SMC reset. When something seems like a hardware problem, sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's an SMC reset. And I think things have worked. Uh, you know, I was traveling for the most part this week. I spoke in what Boston and then uh, and then Philly. And then I'm speaking actually as an aside, I'm speaking on Tuesday night right here in New Hampshire about uh, Wi-Fi and mesh networks and all that good stuff. So uh, come and come and see that if you're going to be around. But um, but that SMC reset seems to have fixed my uh, my issue. So I don't need to send my monitor back to Monoprice, which, of course, Monoprice would have would have done. You know, they would have made it for me. But um, very interesting stuff. So just wanted to share that advice. Any thoughts from uh, from you, Jeff or, or you, John? Well, the dumb question is, what is an SMC reset? That's not a dumb question at all. That's the system management controller. And yep. uh, it, it's essentially the power manager, uh, right? In the, in the Mac, is that, is that the right way to explain it? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Cool. cool. Yeah, and it has. Uh, how, about, how about if we link to how to reset that? We will. That's a great oh, yeah. idea. We've done yeah. that before. Yep. But I think what, what you're doing when you do the reset for it, so I think it's very similar. Uh, it, it manages different things and it holds information or, or parameters, if you will. And I think it's similar to the PRAM in that it, you know, it does certain functions and it stores certain information. And sometimes that information, um, the technical term, I think, is horked yeah. <laughs> or it yeah. gets corrupted. And yeah. sometimes you have to start from scratch. And that's what either an SMC reset or a PRAM reset is, is another thing to always try if, you're, uh, yeah. if your machine is acting up. It, it, um, it's a type of non-volatile RAM. Um, um, word of, word right. of warning before you reset your PRAM, make sure you know how to get back into Find My Mac. This because is true. If you, reset, if you reset your PRAM, it erases all of the Find My Mac information. Yeah. Really? Wow. That almost sounds like um, like a security uh, exploit type of thing there, Joe. Yeah, it does. Doesn't Don't you it? think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our good friend Jeff here has also written an article uh, where the, the resetting the PRAM is an aspect of uh, what we could call a, a security exploit or incident or exploit or whatever you want to call it. I, th I think it's I think it's a huge hole. I think it's weird, actually. And 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 to address what what John is alluding to, uh, Jeff did put up an article uh, that Find My Mac has this serious security vulnerability. And a couple of people in our in our market, as as people are want to do, uh, called you out on that, Jeff, and said yeah, they, they told me I was writing clickbait. They told I've, you <laughs> I've never I've never done clickbait in my life. <laughs> You won't and, believe what happens next. That's right. Yeah. Now that would have been clickbait, but to call people, people didn't, <laughs> I think it was that people that, and they were and some of these people are, are very serious about security and they did not like that you called this a security vulnerability. And so that was what elicited the reaction of right. this and, is clickbait. And to, be, and to be fair, you know, the, in the news, in the media, even in what we do, the the emphasis is usually on data security, securing the software. Right. And we've gotten away from worrying about physical security. Nobody mentions Kensington key locks anymore, huh. even though they're usually there. Um, you know, nobody nobody really talks about the fact that the physical security of your device is just as important as the security of the software on it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, for that, example, it's a very thing, good point, man. One thing where I've seen this happen, um, well, it happens anywhere that you have banks and ATMs. Uh, some uh, nefarious people will install what's known as a uh, card skimmer, I believe. And it's basically something that will read the stripe off of your card and then you put it in the ATM and you get your money and then you take it out, not knowing that someone has collected that information, which if you know what to do with it means that you can make another card and then you're right. good. 
And, and some people may say that's a security exploit. Yeah. I would I would agree, and it's a f- kind of uh, you know sneaky one. Uh, it's not network based, and it's not. Uh, but, but but it is. I say right. It's another type of exploit, and and it's not that. it's not just ATMs. Um, here in oh, northeast stores, Ohio, right? Here in northeast Ohio, there's been a there's been a, a rash of people replacing the card readers at um, the gas pump, <laughs> so that now. Oh, man. There, it's been it's been in the news that you need to you need to look closely, make sure that the that the seal isn't broken. Oh, yeah. And if the seal is broken, don't use that pump. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, wow. <laughs> <sighs> Fun stuff. All right. Um, what I want to do uh, is I want to talk about Rob. And uh, and and we'll we'll change gears again a little bit here, and then uh, and then I want to tell you about our our three sponsors here. So, uh, Rob brought up a great question. Rob and I were having a, a email chat back and forth about um, about routers and cable modems and things like that because because it's a topic that I love, as any listener knows. And uh, and Rob said to me, he says, "I know you like renting the cable modem." But you should do a show on buying cable modems for those of us who are price sensitive. There are good recommendations on units that will save a lot of money in a short period when Comcast wants to bill you 10 bucks a month for the modem. And uh, Rob is absolutely right. Um, Some listeners might remember that I did move away from renting my cable modem last year. But uh, since Rob missed it, I figured maybe many of you did, too. Yeah. It, there, so my reasons for renting a modem uh, from your cable company still uh, apply. And that is when you have a problem, uh, it doesn't allow the cable company to just point to the modem and wipe their hands clean and say, yep, uh, it's your modem. You know, you got to get a new one. And, and then the service tech gets to leave that that is avoided when you are using a modem that your provider um rents to you or, or provides to you. Some people don't pay a rental fee like your, your cable company, John, I think, um, I guess you pay a rental fee, but there is, it is not broken out separately. <laughs> if I give it back to them, I don't get a credit. Right. Exactly. That's the right way to say it. Well, yeah, exactly. As far as I, but I don't get charged separately for it. You don't they get do charged charge separately. me separately for my cable cards, but um, right, right, right. So I, yeah, I don't get charged separately for my, for my cable modem either. And in fact, the only way I can, put my own cable modem on their system is if it's a just a cable modem. Um, I actually own a Netgear um, cable modem slash wireless router combo. Yeah. And Armstrong won't let me use it. Interesting. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was, it was a real pain in the butt when, you know, I, I moved in here and, the people I moved in with, they were still using wireless G and it was just too slow for me. So I couldn't use something I'd already paid one hundred and seventy dollars for. I had to go out and buy a new wireless router because I couldn't use my combo unit. Right. 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 Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking here. So Optimum says uh, two options, uh, Optimum provided modem. And then they say option to purchase your own modem. So Optimum. But they say, if you purchase your own, we'll advise you on which are compatible, but yeah. you don't get any tech support. And if, it, if, it, if something right. bad happens, then it, it may be your fault. So, and and Armstrong, Armstrong will let me buy my own cable modem, but, on, but only if it's just a cable modem. So it sounds like, and, and guys, don't take this the wrong way, but it sounds like a lot of the smaller market um, uh, carriers just provide modems. Uh, at least that's the case for, for the two of you that, that they don't charge you for um, most of the larger market carriers like time Warner and, uh, and Comcast will charge you a rental fee for that modem. And, and so um, there are, there are several decent modems out there, but as you guys just pointed out, you need to make sure that whatever modem you get is certified by your provider. The, the model number of that modem is certified by your provider, but you can save a bunch of money. Um, I, I'm currently running 
a Motorola 74 MB 7420. Sorry, Motorola MB 7420. That is a 16 by four cable modem and uh, and works really, really well. It's been it's been rock solid for me. It's about 80 bucks at uh, at Amazon. And uh, and so I will put a link to that in the show notes. But um, the the other very, very popular one is the um, the Aris Surfboard 61 SB 6190. I don't know why I want to avoid putting the uh, the letters in, I guess, because nobody ever talks about the letters. <laughs> but um, but that one's also very popular. That's about one hundred and six bucks right now at uh, at Amazon. So but even still within a year. You can uh, you can make your money back on that. And um, the Aris, the the 6190 is a 32 by eight, meaning it's got 32 downstream channels and eight upstream. And uh, and and so chances are you don't have speeds that would make a difference there. But where the extra downstream channels make a difference is if you are in a crowded area, uh, some Comcast will bind I believe they will bind up to 20 downstream channels regardless of your speed. And, uh, and that can help deal with some of that congestion. So that's where having more of those downstream channels can matter, even if the speed multiplier doesn't necessarily matter for you. So that's, uh, that's my thoughts on that, John, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I guess you don't, you don't think about what cable modem to buy. Cause you can't, it doesn't matter to you. Well, I, I'm very happy. I, uh, yeah, I have a, it's an Aris, uh, Doxis three and I, I get the speeds that I'm happy with and it's, it's not a bottleneck and they provide the support. So there you go. Works for me. Sweet. Fun, fun stuff. Um, all right. What else do we have here? I'm trying to look here. Um, yeah. What else do we have? All right. Well, uh, those are those are basically the two cable modems. Jeff, do you have a uh, a cable modem that you like? Which which what is the one that you're using right now? Um, I you know what I don't know for sure. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, that's fine. I, I think I think it's no. I don't know. I haven't paid okay. close. Attention. Okay, I have had good luck. It, you know, if you're if you're going to look at brands, um, I would look. At the, the Motorola's are great. So Motorola used to sell the Aris brand. Um, but, uh, they, that relationship ended now Motorola actually sells cable modems made by zoom, but the ones that Motorola sells, uh, have additional features in terms of just reliability that zoom doesn't put into their own. In fact, when I talked to the folks at zoom, they said, you're better off getting a Motorola modem than you are a zoom modem. So get the Motorola, uh, for that. The Aris modems uh, have always been great for the most part. And, and certainly the 6190 is, um, is, is, you know, the, the, uh, a great yeah. one that a lot of people recommend and works very, very well. I have also had good luck with Netgear's cable modems, uh, by and large Netgear's modems, like you mentioned, Jeff, are combo modem routers. So you have right. to make sure you're picking the one you like. The R7000 is essentially the, um, the combined modem and router version of, uh, sorry, I think it's the C7000 is the combined modem and router version of the R7000 uh, router. Yeah, I is, think I think their their combos, the model always starts with C. With a I think C. Mine is a right. C630, I think. Okay. Yeah. So that, that Netgear C7000, you know, it's, it's got a, it's got decent radios in it and, and all of that stuff. But uh, I like to keep that stuff separate. But uh, but I did have good luck when I was running that uh, that Netgear one. All right. Actually, it's a C sixty three hundred. Oh, there you, yeah, that would make more sense, right? And see, here's you know when when I was on Time Warner, which in in that market it's now owned by Spectrum. I had this C sixty three hundred, and the reason I bought it was because the one that the one that Time Warner provided was not dual channel. Oh right. And as far as I could find out, um, I think. Surfboard Aris does have a dual channel okay. router you can buy, but it's a lot more expensive. It's a lot more C expensive. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, uh, I promised that I was going to tell you about our sponsors and I would love to do just that. Is that, uh, does that work for you guys? I'd love to hear about our sponsors. Awesome. Sure. All right. Our first sponsor today 
as always, is for the geeks out there, but this is for the geeky travelers. And not just geeky travelers, any travelers. And that is Away Luggage at awaytravel.com slash MGG, where coupon code MGG gets you 20 bucks off an awesome suitcase that is totally engineered for you. This suitcase has a USB port in it. Actually, it has two USB ports, one of which can charge at 2.1 amps. It's got a 10,000 milliamp hour battery inside. It's got a lifetime warranty. It's got a 100-day free trial and free shipping to the continental U.S. These suitcases from Away are very cool. It's a really lightweight construction, but a, a hard shell, which sort of is, is betrays what you might think of a hard shell suitcase. It's awesome. And they have carry-ons in two different sizes, a smaller one, and th th that's called the carry-on, and then a larger one that's called the bigger carry-on. Then they have a medium and a large suitcase for extended stays. One of the other cool things about this is the way the inside of the suitcase is laid out. There's one side that's for all your soft stuff, like, you know, your shirts and your underwear and your, you know, your clothes, right? And that one cinches down. It's got this cool little... Um, the pad that sort of sits and it cinches down to compress that stuff in. The other side is for the things that can't compress, like your shoes and your bathroom case and your, you know, your chargers that you're going to use uh, if, with the wall, right? Your wall plugs and all that stuff. That's in the other side. And that's got a zippered closing pouch in order to keep all that in place. Very, very cool stuff. Check it out awaytravel.com slash MGG. It's my new favorite suitcase. Promo code MGG gets you 20 bucks off at checkout. Our thanks to away at awaytravel.com slash MGG for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor today, of course, for geeks out there, because that's who we all are, is for the coder geeks out there. Bitbucket at bitbucket.org slash for the code f-o-r-t-h-e code is where you can go to start your free account bitbucket is the git solution for professional teams they're using uh they're in use by over five million developers uh it is fantastic. Bitbucket has the world's best pull request algorithm. It's got built in continuous delivery and it's got integrations with all your favorite tools like Docker, AWS, Azure. And of course, because Bitbucket comes from Atlassian, it offers the best Jira integration available, giving your team everything you need to take your code from concept to customer. Now, here's the thing. Bitbucket is your Git repository. It allows you to maintain all your version control. You know what changes have been made either by you or someone else. A lot of people say you don't need version control if you're just a solo coder. Nothing could be further from the truth. I know from firsthand experience. My own worst enemy when I'm coding is me six months ago, right? And that's because I don't remember why I did what I did. Bitbucket lets me track when I did it and put in little comments when I commit to the repository. You got to check this out. Bitbucket.org slash for the code, because that's where you're going to start your free account. And you're going to be in great company when you do it. Bitbucket.org slash for the code. Our thanks to Bitbucket and Atlassian for sponsoring this episode. Our third sponsor today, also for the geeks out there, is Jamf. Actually, it's Jamf now, and you can learn more about it at Jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash M-G-G. Jamf now helps you manage all your Apple devices from anywhere. Right. When you first start your business, it's pretty easy to keep track of your own computer and your phone because it's just you. And, you know, that's that's pretty simple. But as you grow and you start to buy more tech, not just for yourself, but for your employees, it gets harder and harder to keep track of everyone's Macs, iPhones and iPads. Figuring out how to secure the iPad that your sales rep lost can be tough, especially in today's world where your sales rep might not be in your office with you. Jamf now makes that and a lot more much, much easier. You can configure settings, protect sensitive information. You can even lock or wipe a device from anywhere. 
Jamf now secures your stuff so you can focus on your business. No IT expertise needed. So I said this is for the geeks. It is because we're all geeks, but you don't have to be a geek to really take advantage of this. Listeners, you can start securing your business or even your kind of extended home, I think, today by setting up your first three devices for free. And then you can add more additional devices are just two bucks a month. But here's the thing. Those first three devices are free forever. It's not like a free trial because it's not time limited. If you only have three devices in there, it's free forever. Like I said, you go to jamf.com slash MGG, J-A-M-F dot com slash MGG. Register your first three devices for free today and uh, see how you like it. Our thanks to Jamf for sponsoring this episode. All right, let's uh, let's jump to yet another different topic here because uh, we've done a lot about security. We've done some stuff about uh, fun, our, one of our favorite topics, routers and cable modems. So let's uh, let's jump to 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 audio. We've got a couple of things about audio. Uh, Chester writes, he says, I recently took the plunge and bought a 55 inch LK LG 4K TV. I sold my plasma before moving last year and I miss it very much every day. Uh, I'm not ready to spend the money on OLED just yet. He says, anyway, now that I have a decent TV and an Xbox one, my cheap little Samsung soundbar isn't really cutting it. He says, I know you're into headphones and speakers, Dave. So tell me. Which soundbar is the best right now? Which one is the best and which one is the best for the money? I've been looking at the play bar from Sonos ever since I heard you talking about the play bass recently. I need to find a place where I can listen to one in person. Yeah. So um, the uh, I, I really like the new Sonos play bass. And fi finally, now I can I can talk more about it. The, the review went live this week. It um, Sonos will tell you. That the play bar is for you if you want to mount your TV on the wall and the play base is for you if you have your TV on a stand. And certainly from the form factor uh, standpoint, that makes sense. I will say that in general, I like the sound of the play base better. Um, that's the one that goes under your TV on a stand. They've added a subwoofer to it uh, that the play bar doesn't have. They are both the same price. They're not inexpensive. They are six ninety nine a piece. So, uh, but with that subwoofer in there, and just the way they engineered this thing, it not only does it sound great for TV and movies, which is you know the, sort of the one thing you'd use it for, but it is fantastic for music, and it has become our uh, living room music listening solution, which I did not expect it to to do. We had two play five spread out in a you know stereo pair. So I really kind of expected to to prefer that, but but I do, and I, I still love that. But the the play bass sounds great. So uh, that's certainly the best one that I would find that I would uh, say, and and it it the the operation of it, it's just like any Sono stuff, right? It's totally seamless. It it just works. You start playing your movie, and the sound comes out. If you want to play music, you grab your iPhone, you launch the Sonos app, and you tell it, or you launch the Spotify app because that works too, and uh, and it it you know. It just you start playing music. It's all sort of automatic. But if you want to save a bunch of money, um, the JBL Cinema Bass also sounds pretty good. It's much taller than the than the Sonos one, but it it's got some low end. We have one of those in our um, downstairs in our playroom for the for the TV, and um, and you know it's it's less than half the price of the Sonos. It's sort of a pain in the neck to play music through it. To be perfectly honest. Um, you've got to do Bluetooth pairing and, and all of that. So it's not that it's not that Sonos experience at all. We have that and a play one down in the in the playroom. And uh, and so, you know, that's <laughs> that's how that works. Uh, we have a separate device to play music down there. But uh, but for just TV sound, the, the JBL cinema bass, it's pretty good, especially for a smaller room. So yeah, any uh, any thoughts, questions from from either of you guys? I don't I don't know what what your uh, what your uh, audio, th your level of interest in audio is Jeff. I'm pretty simple. Um, I've got a, a black magic set that I bought at Walmart that it's two, uh, two speakers and a subwoofer beneath my desk. And yep. that's good enough for me. There you go. There you go. Cool. Uh, and John, I know you, uh, you know, my setup, I got I a, uh, 100 watt Sony tuner and some uh, right. pretty basic speakers and uh, 
Sounds good to me. There you I think go. it sounded good to you. Yeah. Media. John's John's neighbors don't like him much, do they? <laughs> uh, it's not that loud. It, I mean, it's a, it's no? decent sound. No, no, no. I mean, it's oh, fine. I could I could make it loud. Sure. And um, okay. And even better, the uh, I still have the uh, you want to talk loud audio engine. Every now and then, I got the audio engine uh, speakers, <laughs> and those go to eleven, man. But Honestly, rare. and most of the time, I when I'm watching videos or watching movies, I just use my headset mm. um, because hmm. it's usually late at night. One of my roommates is 87 years old and he's right across the hall from me and I don't want to wake uh, him up. Right. Right. Yeah. Music well, out you're in me, an apartment. Yeah. You gotta yeah. Be. Music out loud is a wonderful thing, but it ha- you have to be in an environment where music out loud doesn't m- make you worry about what is going to happen when other people hear it. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. 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 All right. Very cool. On the subject of audio, I want to uh, jump to John here. Not not you, John, necessarily, but uh, listener John that writes. He says, I've been having issues controlling the sound volume with my Mac mini attached to an LG 34 inch ultra wide via Thunderbolt and finally found a little utility that will let me do it. Um, Mac OS doesn't allow the volume keys to, keys to be operational on HDMI or mini display port Thunderbolt connections because it assumes it is a line out and you should use the remote on the screen. Uh, he said Soundflower is what I am using. It used to be maintained by Rogue Amoeba, but it is now available at GitHub. And uh, and he says that uh, that this allows you to use the key. What he does is he says it let Soundflower lets you route your audio to the Soundflower device and then you can route Soundflower to your screen. Uh, it essentially acts as a pipe in the middle, a software pipe, but a pipe nonetheless. So by doing this, though, it allows you to use the keyboard volume keys because you're controlling the Soundflower volume. So so the way Soundflower works is it adds another audio device uh, both for input and output, and you can hook things up however you like. So what he's done is he uses Soundflower as his audio output device for his Mac, and then inside Soundflower he routes that sound to his uh, to his display. So now he can use his audio, um, you know, keys the the uh, volume keys rather on his Mac to uh to control the volume on his lg display that's pretty cool soundflower is is uh, available for free rogue amoeba didn't write it but they took over maintenance of it when cycle 64 i believe that's the name of the uh the company that that created it originally uh when they sort of abandoned it rogue amoeba picked it up thank goodness because us podcasters uh certainly here at mac geek gab we have used soundflower uh, or something like it. We for every single episode of Mac Geek Gab that we've ever done, um, and then Rogue Amoeba kind of took it from there and uh, and created something called Loopback that uh, is a a commercial product uh, that that does what Soundflower did and and quite a bit more in a in a more robust package. But um, but for the simple use that uh, that John's talking about here, Soundflower is perfectly adequate as long as it continues to work. And, and it seems like it works with Sierra, which is bingo, bango. It That's awesome. does work, but there's some there's some hiccups to it. OK. And, and maybe I haven't found the, the real missing link, but I followed. Um, I have that same problem. I have an LG monitor plugged into my Mac mini through HDMI. And. Um, I, I followed a, a walkthrough that I believe Thorin wrote over at Lifehacker. And it required installing Soundflower as well as Soundflower Bed. Because if you install Soundflower on its own, you don't get anything in the menu to adjust the right. settings. You have, you have to go into audio MIDI settings and, and try to do things there. And that just doesn't seem to work right under Mac OS Sierra. So you need Soundflower Bed which is old, it's no longer developed, it's, it works, but there's a bug in that I turn my monitor off when I leave my computer. Whenever I do that, Soundflower disconnects the HDMI, and when I turn my monitor back on, it doesn't reconnect uh. to the HDMI. I have to go back into Soundflower Bed, push all the changes through again, and Soundflower Bed has a habit of dying. Um, just locking up on my on my mini. 
So I have to force quit Soundflower Bed, start it back up again, and it just it wasn't worth it. Huh. Yeah. Um, okay. I might, I might try a different I might try to change my habits and just set the sleep settings for my display. But I'm I'm so much in the habit of just turning my monitor off when I walk away from it that I don't know if I want to do that. Right. Right. Well, I, I mean, uh, loop back. So I have a couple of thoughts for that. Number one, loop back would do it. it. It's but like I said, it's a for pay product. I think it's it's either 79 bucks or 99 bucks. I mean, it, it's definitely well, it's it's geared towards, frankly, people like me. Right. That we yeah. need it for doing a show like this. And it is it, I mean, like I said, Soundflower was was mandatory for what we did. Loop back takes it to a whole other level. So it's awesome and it's worth it for, you know, producing a podcast. Is it worth it for a home user to just wire up? And I use wire up, you know, with air quotes to wire this up. Uh, probably, probably not, you know, <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. not, probably not. Um, but my thought I mean, for, for a little more than 70 bucks, you could get a, a small HDMI TV that yeah. has a remote control. That's right. Yes. Right. Right. But um, I wonder, though, to solve your problem, it would be to use Keyboard Maestro to script the the little dance that you have to do with Soundflower Bed, including relaunching it uh, and tr and trigger it with an on wake event, which Keyboard Maestro also lets you do. Well, you know what? Um, I saw something about that. You can actually. What was I trying to do? The problem is, for whatever reason, I don't get any events when I turn my monitor back on. Those scripts usually look for events in the in the system log, don't they? Well, wouldn't this? Yes. But wouldn't this be a system wake event or is it just when you turn the monitor on it? There's no there's nothing in the log files at all. All, all that happens is, um, I guess, because there's no system logs to tell me is that the mini finally sees that, yes, I have a, a display I can, I can send my video and sound to. Huh. But it doesn't register in the system log at all that I've been able to find. And I have searched. Try Keyboard Maestro. It, it might not just rely on the system log. It, it, okay. Yeah, because it, I mean, it does a lot of magic stuff. So it's possible. I'll give it a try because I would, I would love, I, I mean, I have... My Blackmagic speakers come with a little dongle yep. that allows me to adjust the volume. It's a rotating dongle, but I would love to do it just straight from my keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's uh, there's one other thing that uh, that really would fall into a cool stuff found. But while we're on the subject of sound, I want to mention it. And it's a piece of software uh, called Sound Control. It's actually Sound Control 2 from staticz.com. This is uh, Dom, Dominic Fiera, who... And I, th I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Dom, uh, who originally or not originally, but but previously was at Ambrosia Software and created a lot of their audio tools and worked on that stuff. So this allows a lot of different things. It um, might solve your problem because it will allow you to reroute audio to any specific device. It might solve John's problem, listener John's problem, because it allows you to add keyboard volume controls to uh, your display port monitors, your HDMI TV, your receivers, exactly what he's talking about here. It allows you per app volume controls so you can adjust iTunes volume separately from, say, Safari volume or from your Spotify volume. Uh, very, very cool stuff. And, and like I said, it, it lets you route your audio from individual apps to different audio devices. So you could have your, you know, your system beeps happen on your Mac speaker, but you could have your iTunes volume and only your iTunes volume go to, you know, like your, you know, if you have uh, Bluetooth speakers connected or something else like that makes it so that your system beeps don't you know, come out and, and shake the house when, when you play them through your, uh, through your, you know, your big system or whatever. So it's a pretty yeah, cool that, little app. 10 bucks. That sounds really cool. Yeah. 10 bucks. Looks like you can download a demo. What does, what does a demo do? Is it a trial version or does it just show what it does? Uh, it's a trial version. The, the demo from, uh, okay. based on my tests. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'll check it out. I, I almost started installing it just now, but I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> please, please don't. I, it might be fine. It just happens that we're recording a show. Yeah, you know? yeah. Not, not a good, I, I realized almost as soon as, before I clicked <laughs> on the DMG, I said, nope, not a good idea. <laughs> Fun stuff. Cool. Um, all right. We're here. We've talked about certificates in this show. We have Jeff with us. And so we're all three interested in this. John, will you take us to uh, to Brian? And then depending on how long Brian takes, maybe we'll stick and, and wrap up this certificate thing with uh, with Michael. But uh, but if, if you wouldn't mind taking us to Brian, I would appreciate it, John. Yeah, it's good stuff. So cool. um, what does Brian have to say? Brian has two questions. All right. So Brian says, um, all right. Uh, first problem uh, on a friend's computer, he and his wife can sign into their admin user account, but the system balks when they try to use the same password to validate anything else, say an application update. Um, and the way that people have suggested permissions, Yasu, things like that. Speak, speak clearly, Mr. Mr. Braun. We need, we need to know what Brian's problem is. Okay. Um, uh, the problem is that Brian, uh, the, Brian's friend is trying to use their admin password to authenticate operations within the finder. Okay. And it doesn't work. Well, isn't that interesting? All and, right. Um, but it's the, so the password that lets the, the, them log into their user account does not let them authenticate when the system says, I need you to, uh, to, you know, let me delete this file or install this app. Yes. Um, huh. only thing I could suggest, and a little birdie told me this will probably fix it here is if you go into, is that they should be the same, but sometimes they get out of sync. How do you re-sync them or get them back in sync? You go to system preferences, user and groups, click on your admin user and say, change password, and change yeah. that password. And hopefully the problem will go away. That's, that's, uh, I've seen that happen where where the passwords get out of sync and you've got, mm -hmm. you know, a different password for your login versus your keychain or whatever. The the other thing that this could be is if they're trying to it, and I and I realize they asked the question one way but but just to kind of close the loop, if they um if this is not an admin account, uh they might think it's an admin account, but but going there will let them confirm whether or not it actually is. It might actually be a standard account. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's I've I've never seen on Mac OS. I've never seen the passwords get out of sync like that. Um, it used to be a common problem when I was doing tech support for Youngstown State University. But, you know, there they had multiple. Multiple password servers that would sometimes oh. get out of sync with one another. Right. Huh. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, I mean, yeah. And, and what you should look for. So in users and groups, you're going to see a few things. So you're going to see the user underneath it. It should say admin. Right. Then there's also a little checkbox, allow user to administer the computer. That should be checked as well. Just make sure those uh, that that just occurred to me looking at this screen here um, and yep. change the password. And hopefully that'll uh, that'll fix it up. But as Jeff said, if. <laughs> If it's a guest, if it's a user account, then this is expected behavior because certain operations with a guest account um, or a non-admin account require an admin username and password, right? But shouldn't it allow you? Shouldn't it tell you it needs an admin account and leave the user field yes. blank? It should. Last I've tried this, yeah, it says an administrator username and password is required to authorize this operation or something similar. To that's that. that's what I thought, and I can't test it right now because I'm doing a bad thing and I'm logged in with an admin account. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I log in with an admin account all the time. I, I mean, it, it, <laughs> we say it's a bad thing and I get that, that lots of people say that, but it is yeah. also the default thing. It is. And I do it too, but you know, my Mac locks after so many minutes. Yeah. And I've got a keyboard shortcut that if I really need to, I can immediately lock it. How do you, how did you set up that keyboard shortcut? I don't remember. Okay. This was, uh, <laughs> let's see, this is a mid 2010 Mac mini. So this was seven years ago. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. 
<laughs> I'm just but curious I'm, if you're doing that in the system or if you're doing it with an app. So maybe you can follow up. If no, you, it's, if you it's, it's it. probably a system preferences. It's okay. probably a hotkey. A hotkey. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've, I've also got a hot corner that does it. Okay, so that would be set in uh, system preferences, uh, mission control, either yeah. either with the uh, the hot corners, which is right on that screen, or, uh, or sorry, the uh, the yeah hot corners and, and hot corners. yeah is is right there in there. So and, yeah, uh, yeah, one one corner is start screensaver and one corner is disable screensaver. Yep, there because it used to be that that watching videos on on OS ten your Mac would go ahead and go to sleep even while you were watching a video. They finally fixed that. Thank God. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Cool. All right, John, the other half of and, uh, Brian's and the question. Other half. Yep. On my own computer, keychain access has a huge list of iMessage encryption key, public key login entries and continues to add more. I would assume these should automatically be deleted after use, but have found no way of resetting the process. And I'm going to refer to uh, our friend MC Hammer um, for some advice on this situation, Dave, is don't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> They're there for a reason. No, uh, I strongly, strongly, I, I don't know how strongly I could discourage you from touching anything in keychain access. Especially There's if you don't reason, know what it is. Yeah. Well, I suspect the reason that they, key, that they, they continue to be there is that the, the keys get changed, and if you want to refer to past messages that used one of those keys to encrypt or decrypt, you want to have those keys present. Right. I, I would say what would happen, the, the, the infinitesimal amount of disk space that you would save by getting rid of those entries will be more than offset by your inability to delete messages that were, uh, to read messages that use those keys yeah. because you won't be able to read them anymore. I so, lost I lost one of my private keys for a GPG or a PGP address that uh, or a PGP encryption uh, uh, setup that I had years ago. And so there are emails in my in my outbox archive and I probably some in my inbox archive that I simply cannot decrypt um, and will never be able to decrypt. And that yep, and that, that sucks. And yep. that's another piece of advice is. Don't delete your old certificates. Yep. Because you know what's going to happen if you delete your old certificates? Any emails that were encrypted with them, you won't be able to read them anymore. Right. Yep. Even even if they're expired, keep them around. Keep them around. Yeah. And I do that. At first, I was like, oh, I want to be nice and tidy. It'll show that they're, you know, they're they're old. They're expired. But um, yeah. It, yeah. It, in this case, it's good to be a pack rat. So, here's, um, yeah. Here's the thing, John. I don't think your mom is going to look in your keychain when she comes <laughs> to check out how clean your house is. Uh, she doesn't even know where it is, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I so. know. Uh, while we're here in key, we have we are out of time for this episode. But while we're here in Keychain Access, John, uh, why don't you extend your advice from uh, from from Mr. Hammer and his entourage <laughs> and his posse? I'm sorry, Mr. Hammer. It's your posse, not your entourage. Uh, and 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 extend that not just to the keys that are your old keys, but uh, but the system certificates too, right? Um, we'll we'll cover that. Uh, yeah, the the. Well, you're saying we don't have time for the second question, but you can saying? give the advice. We don't have to read the question. Okay, just give the, the advice. advice. We're right I, here. Well, okay. we got a question, and someone said, um, "I'm seeing all of these." Uh, uh, things in my system roots uh, keychain and what what it seems what that person thought that meant is that those entities could access somehow access their computer so they started trying to delete them that's another thing mr <laughs> hammer delete the system roots can't touch this. Don't touch this. The system roots are there for a reason. The system roots uh, with SMIME certificates uh, and website certificates, um, you get a warning if a certificate doesn't, if, if a system root is not there, then when you go to a site that uses a certificate from that authority, it's going to say that it's bad or right. it's going to say that it's going to say verification error or something along those lines. Um, so don't do that. Don't. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You, I, I, and we've seen this with people that uh, over the years that have, you know, for one reason or another, uh, deleted these things in here. And, and you know, suddenly web pages, secure web pages don't work. This is where those certificate, uh, the trust of the of the 
um, what did you call it before, Jeff? Not the not the peer to peer trust, but but web the, of trust, the web of trust. There it is. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these are provided by the various certificate authorities to Apple and same with other other operating systems. They provide it saying, here's our we're going to provide this to you. So if someone uses your operating system, access a resource, um, they can they can be sure that the certificate was from us. Yeah. Yeah. Apple put these here for a reason. Leave them alone. Thank you so much for listening, folks. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on and being a part of our uh, our geeky discussions today. It was great to have you, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was cool. fun. I want to thank all of our premium subscribers. And as we have started doing, I want to uh, thank those folks whose uh, contributions came in this week. So in the every six month subscription category, uh, we uh, would like to thank Robert H., Ralph F., Paul K., Jonathan G., Kurt T., Michael G., Chris H., Jeremy F., Mark W., and David C. for your contributions. In the monthly contributions category, I wanted to thank W. Abdullah B., David B., James B., Michael B., also Michael L., Mark R., Doug L., and John G., and uh, that's the $10 monthly thing. The, the biannual, uh, every six month subscription is 25 every six. Thank you for your contributions. And then we had two one time contributions this week. Um, Richard C. Uh, with 100 bucks. Thank you so much. You rock. And Everett T. for seven bucks. Thank you so much. You rock. If you want to learn more about Mac Geekab Premium, go to MacGeekab.com slash premium. And, uh, and you can learn all about it right there. Even just MacGeekab.com will, uh, will link you there. Thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you to our great sponsors this week. Of course, uh, we have Away at awaytravel.com slash MGG, Bitbucket at bitbucket.org slash for the code, uh, and Away Travel, of course, uh, coupon code MGG saves you 20 bucks. And then Jamf now at uh, jamf.com slash MGG. I also want to thank our uh, sponsors in the podcast marketplace. That includes Smile at smilesoftware.com slash geek. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. And Blue Apron at blueapron.com slash mgg. You can call us at 224-888-GEEK. You can find us on Facebook at uh, macgeekup.com slash Facebook. Great little discussion group we have there. It's not so little anymore. It's fun. It's good. All right. So John brought us into this. I'm about to bring us out of this, but um, Jeff, is it possible? Maybe you have three words of advice that you might be able to share with our listeners here. Don't get caught. Made up.